So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to Cambridge. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Mike's a little bit funny. I'm going to talk about uh, quantum networks this morning, and I'm going to illustrate my talk with some uh, recent results from the network we've built here in Cambridge. So that's something that I'll show you later on. But um, let's start with a, a gentle introduction. So the remarkable thing about uh, quantum cryptography, where we encode uh, bits upon single photons, quantum states such as single photons, is it allows us to test the secrecy of the communication. And of course, that's uh, very useful if we want to uh, uh, test for eavesdropping on an optical communication channel, something that we can't do in any other way. And it also provides us a way of distributing secret digital keys and signatures, which will be secure in the future from advances in mathematics and computing, even a quantum computer um, in the future. So what are the advantages of this technology? Well, um, I think the, the main selling point for quantum cryptography at the minute is that it provides us long-term confidentiality of data. Um, current key exchange methods are based upon computational complexity, and they may be compromised in the future if we have more powerful supercomputers or crypto analysis. So what I mean is that information that is stored today um, using public key cryptography might be broken sometime in the future. And of course, um, for many types of information, we won't really care if it's broken and if it's uh, uh, decrypted in uh, several years' time. But for certain types of information, such as um, your genome, for example, um, you would like that to remain secure for a long time. So quantum cryptography is really a good solution for data that we need to keep secret for a long term. Also, we know that quantum cryptography will be secure from a quantum computer in the future as well. Um, Shor's algorithm will severely weaken uh, the security of conventional public key cryptography based on elliptic curve and RSA. And uh, in contrast, quantum cryptography will be secure from all attacks by a quantum computer, both the ones we know now and the ones that may be discovered sometime in the future. So it's a good long-term solution. Um, thirdly, um, quantum cryptography also gives us a very good way of generating random numbers. So um, conventional techniques, which use um, algorithms, um, um, are not so good at generating random numbers. Um, algorithms are deterministic in their nature, uh, whereas uh, quantum processes are um, inherently probabilistic. And so they're very good for producing high entropy uh, random numbers, which is a, a challenge for all forms of uh, cryptography. And finally, quantum cryptography is a physical layer um, technology. It's suitable for low latency and high bandwidth encryption, as I'll show later. And uh, we can use it in conjunction with other quantum safe technologies, such as quantum resistant algorithms in the higher layer of the protocol stacks and achieve a stronger cryptography through this uh, type of multi-layered um, approach. So recently, we've been working with uh, BT to illustrate some of these uh, advantages of quantum cryptography to their customers. And uh, this is a, a showcase demonstration that we've built um, at their showcase in uh, Martlesham in the east of England. And uh, it shows uh, an example of how we can use quantum cryptography at the minute. It shows it being used to uh, secure data, which is retrieved from a bank from an off-site uh, data center. And um, in this demonstration, we show that uh, it's very easy to tap into the optical fiber and to remove the, uh, the data which is traveling along the fiber. We actually built this uh, Perspex box here with which we can tap into the fiber and extract the, uh, the customer um, account uh, data from the, um, the fiber. So this illustrates the sort of uh, short-term uses that we see for the technology. Um, now here, this is a demonstration, but um, in Japan, we've been working on a project uh, which is encrypting uh, real um, user data. Here, uh, it encrypts uh, genome analysis data, which is transferred between a, a life science analysis center in uh, Sendai in northern Japan and uh, the Tohoku Medical Megabank Organization, which keeps, keeps a database of uh, human uh, genome. And uh, we're using quantum cryptography here to encrypt uh, data using one-time pad encryption over a link, which is approximately seven uh, kilometers in length. 
And this is a good example, actually, of data that we'd like to keep secret for a, a long time, and so which is very suitable to quantum cryptography. Uh, the, uh, your genome data you would like to keep secret at least for your lifetime, and maybe also for the lifetime of your descendants as well, so even for um, hundreds of years. So in the near term, we see the, uh, the applications of quantum cryptography as being in point-to-point -point, uh, type um, applications, so things like um, off-site backup um, in quantum random number generation and for mission-critical government and defense links. In the uh, medium term, um, it'll be in networks, QKD networks of the type that I'll talk about later, in the financial sector, healthcare sector, and in uh, corporate networks for cloud storage as well. And in the longer term, it'll be in things like uh, the quantum internet, as it's called, which I'll talk about later. So uh, in quantum repeater networks, quantum sensor networks, and uh, maybe even cloud-based quantum computing eventually. So today I'd like to organize my talk um, along those lines. I'll first of all introduce some of the technology that we need to build quantum networks, then uh, talk about uh, QKD networks, so-called uh, trusted node networks that we can build at the minute. Um, I'll illustrate this with some of the activities that are going on around the world, uh, concentrating especially on what we're doing here in Cambridge. And then in the final part of the talk, I'll talk about uh, fully quantum networks, where we share a quantum entanglement between different nodes, the so-called uh, quantum internet that was mentioned a few times yesterday. OK, so first of all, um, QKD technology. Um, so starting with the, uh, the photon source, we can think about uh, different types of photon source for single photon uh, quantum cryptography. And of course, the obvious choice would be uh, a single photon source. And uh, although there have been some notable um, experiments um, over the, the years, um, a, a useful single photon source is still not um, commercially uh, available these days. Um, so a, a very uh, practical alternative is to use uh, an attenuated pulse laser diode, where we attenuate the average intensity per pulse to be less than one photon per pulse. And um, that works fine, but the problem is that um, Eve can gain some information about the secret key from these multi-photon pulses, which are inevitably produced by an attenuated pulse laser diode. And to prevent um, uh, Eve gaining too much information, we have to very strongly attenuate the intensity of uh, these pulses. And because of that, the secure bitrate that we can achieve using an attenuated laser is much less than for an ideal single photon source. Um, several years ago, though, um, another alternative uh, was invented called the, uh, the decoy protocol. And uh, here we use, again, an attenuated pulse laser diode. But now we modulate the intensity of our pulses coming from the laser diode. In fact, we use three different intensities called the signal, the decoy, and the vacuum. Um, uh, pulses. And by sending these three different um, classes of pulse, we can calculate the fraction of single photon pulses, which are uh, coming from the, the pulse laser diode. And that allows us to more accurately uh, estimate the secure fraction of information in the, uh, in the keys that we form between the, the two ends. So doing that, we can achieve a much higher secure key rate than is possible using just a simple attenuated laser. And in fact, we can approach the sort of uh, key rates that we get using an ideal single photon source. So this is really the most efficient source that we can use for quantum cryptography at the minute, at least for discrete variable uh, quantum cryptography, and is widely used in many implementations. Um, now, I'm going to illustrate uh, my talk mostly with um, the type of quantum cryptography that we use in Toshiba. And in Toshiba, our system is based on phase encoding of weak coherent pulses. And uh, this shows a schematic of the optical layout within the QKD system. It's basically a large um, interferometer. So the quantum information is encoded as a phase difference between two pulses from this um, interferometer. And uh, that's uh, done by passing our weak coherent pulses through this Max Zender interferometer um, here, where the, uh, the two arms have got different um, lengths. That creates uh, an early pulse 
whose phase we modulate using this phase modulator, and a late pulse, which is a sort of a reference. So now the quantum information is encoded as the phase difference between these two pulses. And we can read out the, uh, the quantum information at the other side by now passing our two pulses through a matched interferometer, matched to have the same delay, so that interference occurs at this final um, beam splitter. And now by applying uh, different voltages to their two-phase modulators, the sender Alice and the receiver Bob can determine whether the photon will exit into the top detector and be uh, interpreted as bit zero, or the bottom detector and be uh, interpreted as bit one, and so they can carry out a protocol for QKD. OK, but the problem with the, this type of uh, interferometer-based uh, QKD system is that it's very sensitive to fluctuations in the ambient temperature. Any small fluctuation in the ambient temperature can change the relative lengths of these two paths through the interferometer. And that messes up the, uh, the phase encoding scheme. Um, and uh, also, uh, vibration of the fiber as well causes the polarization um, in the fiber to change. And so the, the polarization state arriving at Bob changes as a function of time. So that means the system is stable for just seconds. And uh, you can see that very clearly in this figure here, which plots the intensity arriving at our two detectors at the end of the interferometer as a function of time, while the system is completely static. So we're not doing anything to the system at all. So you can see that despite the fact that we're not applying any signals to the phase modulator, the phase is, is changing very violently as a function of time um, on a time scale of seconds. And this means that the quantum bit error rate is also changing uh, very wildly with time between some low value and uh, 50%. But um, we can uh, stabilize the uh, interferometer by using active stabilization of the, the phase and the polarization. And uh, we do that by uh, sending some unmodulated stabilization pulses through the interferometer. So we substitute some of our signal pulses with now brighter unmodulated stabilization pulses. And we can use detection of those stabilization pulses in the, uh, the detectors as a feedback signal now to uh, stabilize the relative length of the two arms of the interferometer and also the polarization arriving at Bob. So we use a, a fiber stretcher in one of the two arms of the interferometer uh, to now uh, fix the relative lengths of the two arms of the interferometer. And we use a polarization controller at Bob um, to fix the polarization state arriving at Bob. And using this uh, type of feedback me mechanism, which we call active stabilization, you can see that the, uh, the quantum bit error rate is now stable and has a low value as a function of time. And thanks to this active stabilization, we're now able to operate one-way QKD uh, continuously and for an indefinite uh, period. Uh, OK, so that's a very important technology for all of these um, for quantum cryptography to work in a practical scenario. Um, recently, we've uh, discovered another way, another potential way of directly modulating the phase of a, a gain-switched um, laser diode, which seems um, very appealing. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. And uh, that, instead of using a uh, interferometer to encode phase information on the pulses, in this case, we can directly encode the, uh, the phase information onto our pulse laser diode using a second uh, laser diode which, where we inject a little bit of CW light into our pulsed laser diode. And doing that, uh, we're able to control the phase of the pulses which come from the gain-switched laser diode. That's because the, uh, the master laser diode now um, induces the lasing within the slave laser diode. And so the, uh, the slave laser diode inherits its phase from that of the master. So we can fix the phase of each of the pulses coming from the, uh, from the, uh, the, the slave laser diode. But not only can we fix the phase, we can also vary the, uh, the phase coming from each pulse as well. And we do that by now modulating the current, which is applied to the master laser diode. So if we um, reduce the, uh, the voltage applied to the master laser diode, that uh, changes the carrier density within the cavity, and it therefore changes the, uh, the emission uh, frequency of the master laser diode.
So that changes its phase evolution with time, as you see here. So now when we return the master laser voltage back to its original value, you can see that it has a different phase, and it will impart a different phase to the, uh, the second pulse, which is coming from the slave laser diode. So by uh, modulating the, uh, the voltage applied to our master laser diode, we can modulate the phase difference between the two pulses, which come from the, uh, the pulsed laser diode. In fact, we can modulate any arbitrary phase shift between our two pulses. And the advantage of using this technique for uh, direct phase modulation of the laser diode is that it uses far fewer components than the other way using an interferometer. It uses only low-cost semiconductor devices. And furthermore, it requires only low dry voltages. The VPI voltage for this type of modulation is just 0.35 volts. And that's compatible with CMOS driving. So we can make the optical components much uh, simpler and cheaper. And we can also make the, uh, the electrical drive circuit uh, much simpler as well. And we've used this uh, technique to uh, demonstrate QKD. In fact, uh, we can demonstrate QKD for different types of protocol, uh, BB84 and other protocols as well. So first of all, for the, the BB84 um, protocol, we now um, we want to produce uh, pairs of pulses which have a controlled phase difference, but then we want a random phase between different pairs of pulses. That's needed for the security of BB84. And that we achieve by um, taking the voltage of the master laser diode below the lasing threshold so that we turn off um, lasing. This destroys the phase coherence between these different long pulses from the master laser diode and thereby uh, destroys the coherence between different pairs of pulses which are coming from the device. Um, so doing that, we can implement the BB84 um, protocol and we've seen that we can achieve low modulation errors using this technique and uh, achieve similar key rates to using conventional, the conventional setup for um, phase encoded BB84. And uh, this system also has excellent phase uh, stability because we no longer have the interferometer in the sender. Uh, we find the phase stability is better than using the interferometer, interferometric approach. And what's also interesting is we call this a universal QKD transmitter because just by changing these electrical signals which are applied to the master laser diode and the slave laser diode, we can implement different types of QKD protocol. So we can also implement the differential phase shift protocol where we have coherence between all these pulses. In that case, we, uh, we don't take the, uh, the voltage applied to the master below the lasing threshold. So we keep uh, coherence between all of the, uh, the emitted pulses. We can also uh, demonstrate the coherent one-way protocol as well. Um, in fact, achieving uh, record secure key rates in this uh, demonstration, in this paper here. And uh, yesterday you may have heard my talk, uh, you may have heard my colleague, uh, George Roberts, talk about another uh, protocol, the differential quad quadrature phase shift protocol, which is actually quite difficult to implement um, in other ways, but works very well with this type of direct modulation source for QKD. OK, so that's about phase encoding. We also need to generate uh, random numbers as well for quantum cryptography. And uh, we need to generate those random numbers at very high rates. And um, again, a gain switch laser diode can be useful for that. Um, the, uh, the pulses which come from a gain switch laser diode have got a random phase because uh, Provided we don't, we're not optically injecting any light into the laser, then the laser, uh, then the lasing is started by spontaneous emission, and that starts at a, a random time and so has a random phase. So if we interfere successive pulses from a gain switch laser diode in an interferometer, we find that the output from the interferometer is uh, random as a function of time. And um, here you can see that in this uh, data, which is captured on an oscilloscope as a function of time over a five microsecond period. You can see the output on one arm of our interferometer here looks random. And uh, in fact, uh, the distribution in voltages, which we see in the detector, agrees very well with what we would expect for a random phase uh, coming from the, the gain-switched laser diode. Uh, and. Uh, uh, random numbers have got many applications, not just in QKD, but in cryptography more generally. 
and uh, in things like gaming and lottery and for numerical simulations as well. Um, if you'd like to hear more about this work, you can uh, visit the poster of my colleague uh, Davide Marangon, which is on Wednesday, and uh, see also the talk by Morgan Mitchell of ICFO, uh, who use uh, similar techniques. That's on uh, Friday morning. Um, another very important component, in fact, maybe the most important component, because it determines um, the performance to a large degree, is the single photon detector. And uh, the most common type of single photon detector to use in practical quantum cryptography is an avalanche photodiode. So um, here, uh, a single photon creates an electron hole pair. And then because of a large electric field within the intrinsic region of this PIN diode, uh, we create a, an avalanche of carriers, which creates a, an output pulse of current, which can be detected. Um, and in our single photon detector, we've uh, adopted, uh, adapted this device by adding a detection circuit, which we call the, the self-differencing circuit, where we look at the difference between the output from the device for one detection cycle compared to the previous detection cycle. That allows us to cancel the uh, capacitive response from the device, the background signal, which is seen from every cycle, and leave just the weak single photon avalanche. So using this uh, detection circuit, we can detect much weaker avalanches than are possible otherwise. And this allows us to detect um, avalanches much more frequently than would be possible using an ordinary APD. In fact, compared to an ordinary Geiger mode um, APD, we can uh, gate this device at frequencies up to 2 gigahertz. And this allows us to have a much higher maximum count rate of up to 1, 1 billion photons per second. Uh, we can also have higher detection efficiencies, uh, better uh, timing jitter, and comparable dark count probability and after pulse um, probability with this device as well. So it's very well suited to uh, detecting single photons when we know the arrival time of those single photons, which is the case in quantum cryptography. So now we've talked about the different um, technologies used for uh, quantum cryptography. Let's talk about performance measures of QKD systems. And the main performance measurement, uh, performance uh, measure is the secure key rate at different uh, fiber lengths. Um, so that's plotted here as the secure bit rate on a logarithmic scale as a function of the length of the fiber. And uh, you can see that it, uh, the secure key rate reduces expo exponentially as the fiber length increases. Uh, this is because of uh, scattering in the optical fiber. So the loss of a standard optical fiber at 1550 nanometers, where uh, the transmission is optimal, is 0.2 dB per um, kilometer. And um, there's really not much that we can do about that loss in the, the fiber that's in the ground. It's possible to buy lower loss fibers, which have a slightly lower loss of, say, 0.18 dB per kilometer and even 0.16 dB per kilometer in some cases. But uh, largely, we have to live with this uh, sort of loss in the fiber. So it means that the signal rate reduces by around an order of magnitude for if the, every 50 kilometers of fiber. And eventually, at some point, the signal rate becomes comparable to the noise rate. And this causes the quantum bit error rate to rise. And uh, that causes the secure bit rate to decrease very rapidly to zero. So the maximum secure key rate that we can achieve, which is at, at, uh, a sh for a short fiber length, that's determined by a number of factors. So first of all, there's the source repetition rate, uh, which in our system and in others as well is around 1 gigahertz. Then we have to factor in the source efficiency, which for the decoy protocol, that's the intensity of our signal pulses, which is typically has an optimum value of around 0.42 photons per pulse. Then we have the loss that occurs in the receiver in Bob's equipment, which is typically around 0.5. We have the uh, detector efficiency, uh, which is typically around 25% under the operating conditions that we use. And uh, then we have the sifting efficiency of the protocol. So that's the probability that Alice and Bob have used the same basis for their for their uh, detection, and that's uh, typically around 
And then finally, we have the efficiency of error correction, privacy amplification, and the finite size effect, which of course depends upon the protocol that's used. Um, here in this particular example that I'm showing, this, these lines here show some simulated data. Uh, we have quite a low um, quantum bit error rate, so we achieve quite a high protocol efficiency of around uh, 0.37 or so. So taking those different factors together, we get a maximum a possible maximum secure key rate of around 17 megabit per second for a short fiber length. Um, however, in a real um, QKD system, there is another factor that we have to consider as well, and that is the, uh, the photon processing bottleneck. So it's very difficult to get um, the sifting process and the error correction and privacy amplification to work at those very high rates. So in a practical system, actually, there is a bottleneck which typically li limits the maximum secure key rate in this example to around uh, three megabit uh, per second. Recently, um, however, we have uh, found uh, a way to overcome this photon processing bottleneck. And in fact, we've realized the first QKD system which operates with a bit rate over 10 megabit per second. Uh, this is using these high count rate room temperature self-differencing APD detectors. And uh, here we've completely redesigned the system to have uh, to make high throughput sifting electronics, in fact, which can cope, up, can cope with count rates of up to 250 mega counts per second, and also implemented hardware-based error correction and privacy amplification, which works with rates of over 100 uh, mega counts per second. And doing that, we can achieve uh, a much higher secure key rate than previously for this uh, channel, which has a 2 dB loss we have an average secure key rate of 13.7 megabit per second, averaged over uh, four days. And you can hear more about that in the talk of my colleague, Julianne Yuan, on uh, Thursday morning at 9.35. And uh, for those of you coming on the lab tour, we'll also make a demonstration of this uh, system this afternoon. So the other um, important metric is uh, what is the longest link that we can operate a quantum cryptography system over? What is the range of a single QKD link? And um, as I mentioned earlier, that's determined largely by the noise in the detector. Um, we need the, uh, the signal rate to be uh, larger than the noise, significantly larger than the noise in the detector um, in order to be able to do QKD. And uh, when we use a room temperature detector, as I've been talking about up until now, that uh, range is typically around 100 kilometers or so. But we can extend the range of QKD by now cooling the detector. So by using thermoelectric cooling of the detector to minus 60 degrees C or so, we can reduce the detector dark count down to around 10 counts um, per second. And uh, as the simulation shows here, the gray line, that can extend the range of practical QKD out to around 240 um, kilometers or so. And uh, here now you see some experimental data that we've taken, you, uh, shown as the red points here. In fact, for each of these fiber lengths, we've used the detector temperature, which gives us the optimum secure bit rate. So for short fibers, we're using uh, room temperature detectors. And for longer fibers, we're using detectors cooled to around minus 60 degrees C using thermoelectric cooling. So that's the maximum range that uh, we can get out to. And of course, it's possible to extend the range even further if we use um, detectors which have lower dark count rates. For example, using superconducting nanowire detectors, it's possible to get to even longer um, QKD links than this. Uh, USTC have reported, in fact, up a link of up to 404. Uh, kilometers, which is the longest to date, I believe. And that's uh, using MDI QKD superconducting detectors with very low dark count rates and also ultra, loss, ultra low loss fiber um, as well. So pulling out um, all the stops to get the, the longest distance possible. OK, so that was my introduction to QKD technologies. Now I'd like to move on to talk about um, QKD um, networks. So um, you might ask, first of all, why do we need um, networks? And uh, well, that's for a, a number of reasons. In classical communications, 
Uh, we build networks, first of all, because we want to extend the communication distance beyond a single link. Um, as we've just been talking about, individual links have a, a range limitation of a few hundred kilometers. So if we want to communicate over a longer distance, then it's good to build a network to do that. Um, networks also allow um, scalability. We can, have, um, we can connect any point in the network to any other point in the network using just of order n links, where n is the number of nodes we have in our network. If we were using just point-to-point -point links, then of course we would need order n squared uh, links, so things would very quickly get out of control. So um, using a network gives us much better scalability. Um, also, um, it's very easy to add an additional user to this network. Um, we can just connect them to the network, and then um, their communication can be relayed through the other nodes to any other point in the network. So that gives us good flexibility, and it means that another user can be added at marginal cost as well, which is good. And uh, finally, um, a network also gives us uh, resilience as well. So if uh, one of the, the links was to fail for some reason, then we could route the traffic through uh, other paths in the network around uh, that failed link. So these are good attributes in a conventional communication network, and they're also good attributes for a quantum um, network as well. So we can extend the distance of uh, QKD using um, key relay. And um, here the idea is that we can use um, QKD over local links to form uh, local keys, K, A, B, as you see here. And then those local keys can be used along with the one-time pad cipher to make a, a one-time pad tunnel, which we can use to then send a global key from, uh, from one end, from node A to node D, uh, through this one-time pad tunnel. So using key relay, we can secure the, uh, the global key in the, the fibers between the nodes. Um, although, of course, it doesn't um, protect the key within each of the intermediate nodes. So key relay uh, can extend the, um, the QKD distance, provided uh, we can place these intermediate nodes in a trusted location. So in point-to-point -point QKD, we have to trust the two endpoints of the, uh, the QKD system. And in a quantum relay, we also have to trust the, the, immediate, the intermediate uh, nodes in the communication as well. OK, and we can apply this concept of a key relay to a, a trusted node QKD network, um, like you see in the schematic here. So a trusted node um, network allows us to deliver application keys between any two nodes in our network, between node A and node E, for example. And uh, that's using key relay, where we use QKD for local keys, as I've just um, explained. And then those local keys are used along with the one-time pad to make a, a tunnel, where we can encrypt the, the global key passing um, through the network, through each of the tunnels. And in a trusted node network, we can also um, have uh, scalability, flexibility, and resilience. So we can easily add a, an extra um, user to the network at uh, the marginal cost. And uh, if one of our links is compromised or uh, failed, then we can uh, route the key material through an alternative uh, route um, through the, the network. So it brings us many of the advantages of uh, networking. And some of the examples of trusted node networks in the past are the SECO QC network in Vienna, uh, the Tokyo QKD network, and uh, the Cambridge network, which we're setting up at the minute. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, in a trusted node network, we have to place these intermediate nodes at a, a trusted location, a uh, secured uh, location. Um, but there are various ways of reducing trust in, the, in trusted node networks. Um, so one of those, for instance, is to use uh, multiple paths for the key delivery. So um, if we uh, form a key over two paths in the, in the network, which are not um, intersecting, then we can form the, uh, the final global key by combining those two keys formed over the two paths in some way. We could do an XOR operation, although as we heard yesterday, maybe we should use some other way of combining the, uh, the two keys using um, a hash function. 
And uh, this may be advantageous if the network infrastructure is owned by multiple entities, for example, and uh, you don't want to place trust in one of those um, entities. And it can be implemented quite uh, straightforwardly in a large trusted node um, network. So that's one way of reducing trust in a trusted node network. Another way is using MDI QKD. So in MDI QKD, it's no longer necessary to trust uh, some of the nodes within the network, uh, specifically the uh, detection nodes um, within the network. It's uh, no longer necessary to trust. And uh, in fact, uh, my colleague uh, Marco Luca Marini has uh, uh, suggested, proposed a, a new type of uh, MDI QKD, which is reconfigurable. So we can either form uh, QKD keys between um, adjacent nodes when we trust the intermediate node between Alice and Charlie and between Charlie and Bob. Um, or if we don't trust the intermediate node, we can form MDI keys between node A and uh, node B. OK. Um, so now I'd like to move on, move on to talking about how we can integrate uh, quantum networks into conventional communication uh, networks. And uh, that's really very important if we want to uh, have ubiquitous use of quantum communications in the future. You know, the communication infrastructure uh, is very expensive uh, to build. So if we want to implement um, QKD wildly, widely in the future, we have to use the uh, conventional communication infrastructure, which is in the ground at the minute. And uh, typically, uh, a fiber optic network will consist of access networks, which link the, uh, the, the customer premise to the, uh, the telco central office. Um, and typically, uh, different customers will share an optical fiber. Uh, they might each use a different wavelength on the optical fiber, for example. And that's in order to uh, reduce uh, the cost of uh, connecting them to the network. Uh, so that's the access network. Then the, uh, the traffic from different customers is aggregated together uh, within uh, the metro area. Um, so metro networks typically have higher bandwidths, and they'll use uh, DWDM uh, to aggregate together the, the traffic from different uh, customers. This is the, the metro part of the network. And then in between uh, cities, we'll have even higher bandwidth links, uh, which are uh, backbone networks. So we'd like to develop uh, solutions for quantum communications, which can um, be implemented in different parts of the conventional network. Quantum backbone networks between cities, quantum metro networks within a city, and quantum access networks uh, within a community. And furthermore, we'd also like to reduce the deployment cost of quantum communications by sending quantum signals and classical signals on the same fiber, multiplexed on the same fiber using different wavelengths or other multiplexing techniques. So a good way of building um, a quantum access network is to um, connect uh, multiple QKD transmitters up to a single quantum receiver. And the reason for that is the, uh, the most precious resources within a QKD system are within the receiver. It has the expensive components like the single photon detectors. So it makes sense to place um, all the expensive components in the common node, which is a quantum receiver, at the, uh, the telco point of presence, and to place just cheap components like uh, lasers and modulators at the customer uh, premise. That's the cheapest way to implement this type of access network. And uh, it can dramatically reduce the cost of uh, quantum communications, because it allows users to share both the cost of the fiber. Here they can share different wavelengths in an optical fiber. And also, it allows them to share the cost of the hardware as well, because now they're sharing a common uh, receiver at the end of the access network. Also, it can enable new applications. So access networks are also used in things like uh, uh, control, SCADA networks, uh, for example. So we've made a, an experimental demonstration of a quantum access network. and. Uh, this shows um, how we did that. So in that, we were using, uh, first of all, simple passive optical combiners, where we have um, 8, 16, 32, or 64 ports are combined into a, a single fiber. 
Um, passive optical combiners are very simple components that are widely used in uh, local area networks today, very cheap as well. And uh, here in this demonstration, we connected uh, two quantum transmitters up to our passive optical combiner, um, operating at a clock frequency of 1 over n um, gigahertz, so filling uh, one time slot every 8, 16, 32, or, or 64 um, cycles. And we connected those to a common receiver operating at uh, 1 gigahertz. And, uh, then perhaps the most uh, tricky part of this uh, quantum access network is that we still need to use um, active stabilization. So we need to match the, uh, the delay within this interferometer to the delay in the receiver. And we have to uh, apply the active stabilization to the transmitter side of the QKD system rather than the, uh, the receiver. But uh, that's something that... Uh, we have uh, been able to do. And here now is some uh, experimental results. We show the uh, QBER and uh, secure key rate measured over a 24-hour period. And you can see that the QBER is, uh, has a low and stable value of around 1.5%. It shows the active stabilization is working well. And uh, we have a, an average secure key rate in this uh, one time eight, one this eight-port quantum access network of around uh, 45 kilobits per second uh, per user. And now to test the, uh, the maximum capacity of the quantum access network, we can, now, um, we can simulate a fully occupied uh, network by increase, increasing the, uh, the clock frequency of our transmitters to be up to 500 megahertz. This means that all the time slots are now full within the quantum access network. And uh, you can see that for the different um, node counts, we have a positive secure key rate up to, uh, even up to a, uh, for a 64 uh, node quantum access network. So this shows it's possible to connect up to 64 users to a single fiber in a quantum access network. And we can achieve um, higher uh, secure key rates by using a DWDM combiner rather than a passive optical combiner. So a DWDM combiner has a lower loss. Um, it has, uh, in fact, for an eight-port DWM combiner, you have uh, six times uh, lower loss than uh, for a passive optical combiner. And so um, we can achieve six times higher secure key rate. So for this uh, eight-port DWDM combiner, we have an average secure key rate of between 260 and 300. Uh, kilobits per second. And uh, that's enough to, su to supply each user with 100 uh, gigabyte of key material per month using uh, a system like this. Um, another interesting possibility for quantum networks is using um, optical uh, switching of the, of the routes. Um, so optical switching is very widely used in classical communications at the minute. Um, they use devices called uh, RODEMs, reconfigurable optical add drop multiplexers, which can uh, extract one wavelength from the optical fiber and drop it along a, another course and add uh, other wavelengths onto the fiber. Um, and that's done all optically without converting the signals into an electrical form. So it would be very attractive to also use um, RODEMs for uh, quantum communications as well. The attraction is that uh, we can then programmably connect different points within the network by using uh, different wavelengths of light. By controlling the wavelength of our source, we can determine uh, which detector it goes to. We can have an end-to-end -end optical connection, and so it have end-to-end -end security. Um, on the other hand, uh, these uh, RODEM devices tend to have very high loss. So this might mean that such a, uh, an optically switched scheme can be of only a limited scale and uh, will require the development of very loss-tolerant um, QKD devices uh, to be um, practical. But this is nevertheless a very interesting idea that was proposed by the uh, Madrid, Madrid group a few years ago. So that's uh, something about the topology of different um, quantum communication systems. Now, um, I'd like to talk about uh, multiplexing of um, 
classical and quantum signals onto uh, a single fiber. Um, and ask the question, can we operate QKD on uh, live fibers which are carrying data at the same time? That's obviously very important because if we can uh, send quantum signals on ordinary communication fibers, then we can implement it much more cheaply than if we have to use dedicated fibers which are very expensive. Um, and the challenge there is that the, the data signals are, of course, much more intense than the quantum signals. Uh, typically, um, a data signal might have 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 bits, uh, photons per bit, whereas our quantum signal, of course, is less than one photon per bit. And uh, furthermore, the data signal causes lots of RAM and scattered light on the fiber as well. Here you see the spectrum of that RAM and scattered light. And uh, that RAM and scatter, in fact, is much more intense than our quantum signal. So our quantum signals are completely lost in this sea of um, noise photons. Um, but um, we can um, still extract the quantum signals by filtering the light on the fiber. Uh, so first of all, we limit the uh, intensity of the data laser uh, as much as possible while maintaining error-free data transport. That reduces the, the amount of RAM and scattered light. Secondly, we filter in wavelength, just at the wavelength of the quantum channel. And, and thirdly, we uh, also filter in time, because the detector that we use is only sensitive within a 100 picosecond window. So by filtering in wavelength and also in time, we can uh, extract the single photon signals from the sea of uh, noise photons. In fact, we can reduce the amount of scattered light on the fiber by a factor of 10 to the 5. And this allows us to do QKD on the same fiber. So over the years, we've done a number of experiments where we've multiplexed uh, conventional data along with QKD on the same fiber. Uh, first with uh, one gigabit per second data signals, then with 10 gigabit per second, and now most recently with 100 gigabit per second uh, data signals. This is something we've done in collaboration with uh, ADVA Optical Networking. So here we combine um, signals from a QKD system at 1550 nanometers along with two data channels from this ADVA high-speed encryptor um, around 1530 nanometers. We combine them with a CWDM combiner onto the same fiber. And um, then we use the keys, which are formed by quantum cryptography, to encrypt the data in the high-speed encryptor. And the encrypted data is sent along the, uh, the fiber. So this we call quantum link encryption. And uh, we've seen that uh, quantum link encryption for two 100G signals um, can work for fiber lengths of up to around 100 kilometers or so. So uh, we can operate QKD with uh, 200 gigabit per second of data simultaneously on the same fiber for uh, all fiber lengths up to around 100 kilometers or so. And for a 36 kilometer fiber, we have a secure key rate of uh, 1.9 megabit per second uh, in the presence of uh, this 200 gigabit per second of data on the same fiber. And in fact, this is very comparable bit rate to what we would have if there's no data on the fiber at the same time. So for short fibers, it doesn't really affect the uh, secure key rate. And uh, that key rate is sufficient for over 5,000 AES encryption keys uh, per second. OK, so then we wanted to test what is the maximum uh, bandwidth of data we could send on the fiber at the same time as the quantum keys. So to test that, we add some additional uh, data channels to the optical fiber on the DWDM grid. Uh, we had only two 100G transceivers. So in this case, we're using CW transceivers, but now set to the same launch power as our 100G um, transceivers. Um, so this simulates the effect of having 10 uh, data channels, 10 times 100G, which is 1 terabit per second of uh, data bandwidth. And here you can see the, uh, the quantum bit error rate and the secure key rate um, as a function of time, measured over um, 18 hours. And for this 50 kilometers of fiber, you can see the QKD key rate is still over 1 megabit per second, um, along with uh, the equivalent of 1 terabit per second of data on the fiber at the same time. And again, that's sufficient for forming 3,000 AES encryption keys per second over the optical fiber. So now to further test uh, what uh, bandwidth we can use, now we've um, increased the, uh, the power of each of those 10 um, data channels 
And uh, that simulates, if you like, having even more data channels um, on, the, on, the, um, on the fiber, because here we're in the linear regime. So if we double the, uh, the power of each of the channels, it's like having 20 data channels on the fiber instead of 10 data channels. And uh, this shows the, uh, the secure bit rate as a function of the data bandwidth, um, simulated by increasing the power of our 10 data channels for different fiber lengths, 50 kilometers, 25, and 75 kilometers. And you can see that for a 50 kilometer fiber, the uh, secure key rate rolls off for something like uh, 10 terabits per second. So we can potentially have QKD on a 50 kilometer fiber along with 10 terabits of uh, data at the same time. Uh, and with a secure key rate of 139 kilobits per second uh, at 50 kilometers, so quite a respectable value, in fact. And of course, the amount of um, how far uh, we can do this depends very much on the length of the fiber. For a 75 kilometer fiber, the, uh, the quantum signal will be weaker at the end of that uh, 75 kilometer signal, and we'll also have more Raman signal. So in this case, we can only go up to uh, data bandwidth of around two terabit per second, while for a 25 kilometer fiber, we can probably go to over 40 or 50 uh, terabits per second of data on the fiber at the same time. And uh, we've also investigated uh, multiplexing of access networks, um, uh, multiplexing QKD with uh, conventional access networks, which are carrying data as well. So here we're using a, a GPON network. So GPON uses um, two wavelengths. It uses 1490 nanometers to, for the downstream data, which is broadcast to all the users. And uh, 1310 nanometer is used from the, for the upstream data coming from the user to the optical line uh, terminal, the common point within the, the access network. And we've seen that we can uh, multiplex uh, this data transport along with quantum keys sent at 1550 um, nanometers. Um, provided uh, we um, use two um, feeder fibers, one feeder fiber for the, the quantum signals and the other feeder fiber for the data from the optical line terminal. So we can have common uh, propagation of the, the quantum signals and the classical signals in the drop fiber, which comes from the combiner to the customer. But on the other side, we have to use separate fibers for the quantum and the classical signals. And in fact, we can use the full launch powers in this case and have up for uh, a quantum <coughs> access network, which is up to 128 users and still have a, a positive secure key rate. OK, so that was um, what I wanted to tell you about um, QKD networks. Let's uh, move on now to talk about some practical examples of these uh, QKD networks. And I'm going to concentrate on um, results we've taken here in Cambridge um, recently. But first of all, let's make a little bit of a, a world tour and look at what's going on around the world at the minute. So in Tokyo, they've built uh, the Tokyo QKD network. Uh, Japan has had a, a national project in quantum cryptography for many years, actually, since the early 2000s. And uh, since 2010, they've built the Tokyo QKD network, and uh, that um, incorporates technology from a number of sources. So there are BB84 QKD systems from NEC and Toshiba, uh, differential phase shift systems developed by NTT and NICT, and uh, also ZV QKD developed by Gakushuin University um, as well. And uh, one of the nice things they've done in Tokyo is they've developed lots of uh, different applications for quantum keys. So things like uh, smartphone communications using quantum keys loaded from a terminal, um, TV conferencing, uh, secure IP router that's using quantum keys, uh, uh, protection of medical uh, records. Um, they've demonstrated a scheme for long-term storage of data using secret shares between different nodes in this network, and uh, even communication between um, drones as well has been uh, demonstrated in the, the Tokyo network. And um, we've been collaborating in the Tokyo QKD network since 2010, I believe. Yep, and uh, this is a field trial which we did in 2015. 
where we operated our QKD system over a link between central Tokyo, a place called Otomache, and the western suburbs, uh, Kogane, where the NICT laboratory is based. And uh, this is a 45 kilometer link, which has a loss of uh, 15 dB. And uh, this link is 50% on underground fibers and 50% on aerial poles. Um, so it turned out to be a very interesting uh, study of QKD for us. This shows uh, some results from that. Uh, we could have continuous stable operation over 77 days of operation with an average key rate of 210 kilobit per second. But uh, this field trial was really very useful for us because um, we find that it was a good test of the active stabilization system because uh, much of the route is on aerial fibers. It's exposed to the weather in Tokyo. And in Tokyo, they have lots of weather. In fact, we were doing this trial during the monsoon season. And we could tell which days they had a monsoon just by looking at uh, the performance of the QKD system. Uh, the bit rate and the error rate would uh, uh, oscillate very violently when there were high winds within Tokyo. But by playing with the active stabilization parameters, we were able to get the, uh, the key rate to be much more stable as a function of time. So it was very useful for us. Um, there's also a lot of activity going on in China at the minute. And I'm sure if you're working in this field, you kind of failed to have noticed that. They're probably making the largest investments uh, in this area at the minute. So there are already very large um, 50 and 46 node QKD networks in the cities of Jinan and Haifa. Um, other uh, metro networks are planned in Shanghai and uh, Beijing. Um, you'll have heard earlier this year that they've been doing various uh, quantum experiments, QKD and uh, entanglement distribution from a satellite to ground stations. And uh, there are also plans for building a backbone link from Shanghai to, to Beijing. And uh, I'm sure we're going to hear about progress in that area. Uh, very soon, over a 2,000 kilometer link. So that's uh, the longest uh, trusted relay link um, at, at the moment. Um, so moving on to the US there, uh, the activities are much more fragmented. But let me just uh, pick up on, uh, on uh, one uh, field trial, which is going on in the, the Boston area. And that's between. Uh, the MIT lab in Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, in this case, to the uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory in uh, Lexington. And uh, they've been making field trials of higher dimensional QKD systems, which are using time energy encoding. And in fact, demonstrated very high secure key rates for this uh, 43 kilometer fiber with 16 dB loss. They've shown one megabit per second, which is a very good result. And uh, they've also been doing a polarization-based QKD using silicon photonic integrated circuits um, as well. So the next time uh, the British are coming, Paul Revere can send his secret messages by QKD rather than relying on uh, riding his horse from uh, Cambridge to Lexington. So that's um, New Cambridge. Let's uh, move on to what's going on in old um, Cambridge. So here in the UK, we're also building um, a quantum network as well. Uh, this is a deliverable of the UK Quantum Technology Hub in Quantum Communications. That's its full title, uh, which is a collaboration of eight UK universities led by the University of York, um, and also involving industry partners BT, NPL, and uh, Toshiba Research Europe. And uh, the quantum network is a deliverable of work package three in quantum networking, which is led by myself and involves many um, of these universities and companies, in fact, um, as well. And here's a, a schematic of the network. It involves uh, metro networks um, here in Cambridge and another in Bristol, which we heard about um, yesterday, and also long distance links from Cambridge to London and uh, to Bristol. So Toshiba have been developing uh, technology for the UK quantum network. So this uses similar technology to what we've been talking about earlier. The photon source is an intensity modulated weak laser uh, pulses at 1550 nanometers with a repetition rate of 1 gigahertz. It uses uh, phase encoding and active stabilization. 
Uh, the detectors are self-differencing APDs operating at room temperatures, so they have high efficiency and high detection rates. And we're using wavelength divisional multiplexing, so we can put the quantum auxiliary and data channels onto a single fiber. And uh, the protocol is an efficient uh, decoy pulse BB84 protocol, which includes finite key size effects and has a compos composable security with a key failure probability of less than 10 to the minus 10, so a very low uh, key failure probability. So the first stage of this network is we're building a, a metro network in Cambridge. And uh, this is using the Granta backbone network, which connects together 90 different sites in the University of Cambridge uh, using 32 kilometers of uh, cable, where these cables have either 8, 16, 24, or 48 fibers in each cable. And uh, this is a schematic of the Grantha network. You can see, in fact, it looks very much like the underground map of uh, London, suspiciously like the underground map of London. We even have a Heathrow out here. And uh, the river is flowing in the wrong direction, but otherwise it looks very much like the underground map. Um, it gives you the impression that Cambridge might be enormous, but in fact, all these places are quite uh, close together. And we're using just three sites, in fact, within the, uh, the Granta network. So the first is at the Center for Advanced Photonics and Electronics on the Cambridge West site. Uh, the second is in the engineering department in the center of Cambridge. And the third is at the new museum site, which is in the center of Cambridge too. And then we've also extended the Granta network out to the Cambridge Science Park, to the Toshiba Lab. So that's... Uh, way out there somewhere. I guess it must be the cock fosters of the, the Grant uh, network. It's a, it's a local joke that many of you will understand. And uh, in a later stage, we plan to add uh, quantum access networks uh, within Cambridge as well, on the west side and on the science park. So on the ground, it looks um, something like that. Here's our four sites where we're going to place the, uh, the nodes of the network. Uh, this is Cambridge, seen from the air. Um, so here we have the river flowing through the center of Cambridge. And this area here is the backs, where you have some of the, uh, the colleges. And uh, you can recognize Cambridge from all the parks that we have in the city. So this is uh, Parker's Peace, it's Midsummer Common, Jesus Green over here. Uh, the train station is down here. This is the Cambridge Athletics Cambridge University Athletics track over here. So it's all the sites of Cambridge. This interlude is brought by the Cambridge Tourist Board. Uh, for, um, anyway, the important thing is here are our uh, four sites uh, at uh, Cape, Trail, the new museum site, and the engineering um, department. And then at this stage, I was planning actually to give you a live demonstration of the performance of the network. Um, however, the classical IT for that uh, turned out to be beyond us. Uh, so <laughs> instead, I've made uh, this recording of um, the network yesterday, which may or may not work. Just a minute. Ah, actually, I think in this presentation, well, maybe it's not going to work. Anyway, it's not a very exciting video anyway, because very little happens. Um, <laughs> but this shows the average secure key rate on each of the, the three links, around 3 uh, megabit per second. Oh, it is working, actually. You can see some of the numbers are changing. And uh, so <laughs> that convinces you that it's working. Uh, and it's storing key at each of these nodes. So you can see there's a key store building up. And we also have application keys formed between the different nodes as well. So we have a, a data, 100G data, also running over this link. So you can see that the, the number of keys is reducing as the keys are consumed um, by the network. So this now shows the, uh, the average performance of the system, average over a one-month period for each of the, uh, the three links. So you can see that uh, typically we have a QBAR of around between 2% and 3%, and a secure bit rate averaged over one month of between 2.6 and 3.2 megabit per second. These are the, the highest 
sustained uh, key rates in a field trial to date, I believe. And uh, if you'd like to hear some more about that, uh, please uh, see the poster on Thursday by Adrian Wanfor and uh, James Dines. And you'll also be able to see more if you're going on the lab tour this afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock. And if you're not going on the lab tour, well, I've shown you what you, what you would see there anyway, so you won't be too disappointed. Um, OK, we've also made a, a long-term reliability test on one of the links. So here we've measured uh, the secure key rate and the quantum bit error rate over a six-month period um, on the link between engineering and Toshiba. And uh, we have an average Cuber of around 2.3%, an average sifted rate of just under 10 megabit per second, which you can see is very stable, remarkably stable as a function of time, and an average secure key rate of around 3.1. Uh, megabit per second. And over this six-month period, we were able to distill 47 terabits of key, so a vast amount of uh, key material. We've also been testing, um, for those measurements, we had just QKD operating on the network, but uh, we've also been testing 100G quantum encryption on the network as well. So here we combine QKD and encrypted data onto a single fiber. It's a fiber between Cape and uh, Trail. Um, so we're operating the quantum channel at 15-15 nanometers, and we have a 100 gigabit per second encrypted data channel at 15-30 nanometers on the same fiber. And uh, we refresh the AES encryption key for the data using quantum keys, just like I told you about earlier, but now operating in the network. And uh, here, sh this shows some initial data from that. So we have a a low quantum bit error rate of around 2.8%. And this tells us that there's very little increase in the QPER due to the Raman noise caused by the data, laters, data lasers on the fiber. And it gives us a high average secure key rate of around 3.1 megabit per second. Again, very similar to the value without any data on the fiber. And at the same time, we have error-free data transport after forward error correction. OK, so that's uh, the results for the Cambridge network. Um, we're also building a long-distance QKD network to join Cambridge to London and to Bristol. And that's using the, uh, the National Dark Fiber Infrastructure Service, which is an EPSR facility for communications research in the UK. And uh, here's a schematic of the network. It consists of 650 kilometer of single-mode fiber, along with switching control and monitoring systems. and uh, has 630 kilometers of fiber, 24 links, four access sites, three major interconnection points, and four co-location sites. And uh, we'll be using the stretch from Cambridge to London, a telehouse switch there, and uh, to Bristol. And uh, we've done some initial measurements on the NDIF, NDIFIS uh, network. Um, so here we've been doing trials on a loopback connection from Cambridge to Duxford and back to Cambridge again. This is a total fiber distance of 62 kilometers with a loss of 15 dB. And again, we're combining 100G data with QKD by uh, wavelength divisional multiplexing. And uh, we see that it works well over this uh, eight-day period with uh, a QBER of just over 6% and an average secure key rate of just under 100 uh, kilobits per second. OK, we've also um, implemented um, a new interface between the QKD system and the application layer. And uh, this is be based upon uh, REST protocols. So REST protocols are widely used in the, the World Wide Web. Um, so they're very common. And uh, we hope by using these REST protocols that will encourage uh, more um, vendors to adopt using this uh, type of interface and uh, encourage more third parties to develop uh, applications for QKD, which will be very important in the future. Uh, but this uh, key interface we've also been testing as well. And this data shows that it's working um, very well. So we can see the network is consuming keys over the interface, and then at some point those keys are replenished, and uh, they continue to be consumed after that. So um, the key interface, the interface between the QKD system or network and the application, um, 
is very important, and I think it's very important to standardize that in the future so that uh, all of these networks that have been built up until now can be interoperable um, in the future. And uh, the standardization of uh, QKD technologies has been led by um, ETSE, um, the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. And uh, they have an industry specification group for QKD, whose mission is to develop group specifications and reports for quantum cryptography and ICT networks. And uh, the group there comprises uh, large industry, telecom operators, SMEs, NMIs, governments, labs, and universities. And uh, the current work of the group includes um, specifying key delivery interfaces, so common interfaces, so that uh, we can have interoperability of different QKD equipment and uh, interoperability of QKD equipment and different applications for quantum keys. Another uh, work item is on deployment parameters. So what uh, parameters do we need to specify for QKD systems and networks? Um, the metrology of QKD systems. So how do we measure the performance of a QKD system? And what do we have to measure to guarantee the security of a QKD system? And another very important area is the implementation security of QKD. So how can we ensure that QKD is implemented in a secure way in the future where it has no side channels and doesn't allow um, active attacks by an eavesdropper? So the development of standards is really crucial for the commercial development of QKD in the future. And uh, we already have quite a large group within the ISG, but uh, new members are very welcome indeed. And uh, if you would like to contribute to the ISG, please feel free to contact the ISG chair, which is myself. So uh, come and see me later uh, in the conference. Our next meeting will be in Munich, which is in December. OK, so things are going well. <laughs> and uh, now I can move to the final part of the talk, which is about the, uh, the quantum internet. So up until now, we've been talking about uh, networks where the information is converted from quantum to classical form at the node. But in the future, we'd really like to have networks where the information remains in quantum form in the fiber and also in the nodes as well. Such um, holy quantum networks, um, which are based on distributed entanglement, can enable uh, many uh, new applications, such as quantum relays, quantum repeater networks, distributed quantum sensing, quantum clock networks, cloud quantum computing, and many other things as well. So a very um, exciting uh, possibility. And um, we heard some things about um, theoretical work in this area um, yesterday. Um, I'd like to give you some, some perspectives from the experimental um, point of view this morning, um, briefly. Um, so the technology, of course, for the quantum int internet is much less developed than for a QKD network, and is still, in fact, many years away. But we think in the coming years, we're likely to see some aspects of the quantum internet introduced into a QKD network, things such as uh, quantum relays, uh, for example. And in fact, there's been some uh, remarkable progress on uh, quantum relays recently. So recently, there have been two field trials of quantum teleportation. Um, by the Calgary group and the Haifa uh, group. And uh, these two reports, which were published back to back in Nature Photonics, have some interesting similarities and also interesting uh, differences um, as well. Um, maybe um, I won't describe them in detail, but um, I'll just say that they both show that um, they both use active stabilization to control the arrival time of the two photons at the inter intermediate node where we need to have uh, two photon interference. And uh, they show that using active stabilization, um, in fact, good two photon interference can be achieved. And um, for both the arrival time and also for the photon polarization as well. Uh, and this is even after propagation in field fiber. Um, so that's great. Um, in both cases, the teleportation fidelity was limited by the residual distinguishability of those photons taking part in the two-photon interference, and also multiple pairs which come from the entanglement sources, which are used in this case. So in this case, the entanglement sources were based on nonlinear processes, parametric down conversion in the Calgary experiment, and four-wave mixing in the Hefe um, 
experiment. But still, this is, um, this is good um, progress. Um, I should say also that you can see that from the fidelities and the bit rates that are quoted here, uh, we're still quite a long way from having a practical deployment of this sort of uh, technology on a network, but things are certainly improving. Now, one of the, the current problems are the multi-photon pulses, which are generated by these nonlinear entanglement sources. And uh, in Cambridge, we've been exploring another way of generating uh, entangled photons for quantum teleportation. And uh, this is using a true quantum light source. So ideally, it won't generate those multiple pairs, which uh, impair the performance of the experiments we've been talking about. It's based on using a, an artificial atom, a single quantum dot, within a conventional LED structure. So um, our single quantum dot can hold uh, two electron spins and two hole spins. And the electrons and holes recombine to emit uh, two photons, one right-hand circularly polarized photon and one left-hand circularly polarized photon. But because we don't know which electron in the hole will recombine first, and so which photon will be emitted first, then the emitted two-photon state has to be written as this entangled state that you see here of right-left plus left-right. Uh, so we can produce um, bell, uh, entangled bell pairs using this type of um, LED. And uh, the advantage of this type of entangled LED is that it, first of all, should suppress the multiple pairs from the source. Um, also, it's a compact and robust semiconductor device, so we can fabricate many of these devices on a single wafer. And uh, if we have many devices within a circuit, we can use electrical addressing to control which uh, entangled LED is emitting entangled pairs. So over the last few years, we've been using these entangled LEDs to demonstrate uh, quantum teleportation and quantum relays. And uh, our quantum uh, relay involves three photons. We have an input photon, and then we have two entangled photons from our entangled LED. And by doing a joint measurement on the input photon and one of the two entangled photons, we can then make a unitary transformation on the second entangled photon. And uh, this teleports the input state uh, to the output state. So it's very much like... Uh, the protocol Charles Bennett described several years ago, many years ago. Um, and uh, we've done a number of experiments, so showing teleportation of zinc photons from the same LED at an earlier time, and then teleportation of photons from a distinct source, in fact, a laser source. So that's quite relevant if we want to do, uh, use this for a, a quantum relay for QKD. There we also use laser sources as well. And uh, most recently, teleportation in um, optical fiber. We've also worked on translating these devices from their natural emission wavelength of 900 nanometers by playing with the growth conditions for the quantum dots. We can grow larger dots emitting in the telecom, telecom O-band around uh, 1300 um, nanometers, as you see here. And uh, we've then used those telecom wavelength quantum dots to make a telecom quantum relay, so with typical fidelities of around 88% uh, for the four states used in the BB84 protocol. Uh, we've also shown that um, the teleporter is robust to changing the, uh, the laser wavelength, so we can detune the laser by around 20 uh, microEV and still have good teleportation fidelity. And of course, that's important because during the lifespan of a laser, its frequency uh, will shift. Uh, with aging, so we'd like to test how robust the, the teleportation process is to that aging. And then um, by doing a quantum um, process tomography, we've shown that, in fact, uh, the teleporter can uh, teleport any arbitrary Cupid state with a fidelity which exceeds the, the classical uh, limit of two-thirds. So that brings me to the end of uh, my talk. So let me just summarize very briefly by saying point-to-point uh, -point QKD is now relatively mature from the viewpoint of performance, security, and reliability. Um, integration, of conventional, integration of QKD into conventional networks will greatly expand the number of potential um, applications. Uh, the future challenges will include further improving the performance, the bit rate, and the range reducing the size and cost of the technology, and also standardization and certification. And in the longer term, 
uh, we'll see the quantum internet and a whole range of new applications as well. And finally, let me just uh, acknowledge uh, my uh, colleagues that have contributed to this work in Toshiba and uh, elsewhere, and uh, thank uh, various bodies for funding some of this work. So, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.